The following video is sponsored by CenterPoint Securities, a division of Clear Street. CenterPoint Securities is a direct access broker providing premium tools for the sophisticated trader. Learn more at centerpointsecurities.com. You are listening to the Traders for Cause podcast. Hey folks, welcome to a very special episode of the Traders for Cause podcast. Traders for a Cause has descended on the beautiful city of Boston for the BCRF Hot Pink Party. We're going to be honored with the Carolyn Lynch Humanitarian Award, and in honor of this occasion, I'm hanging out with three of my favorite traders, Greg, Nate, and Lance. We're gonna walk a little bit of the Freedom Trail today, take in some of the sights that Boston has to offer, and talk trading in the process. What do you think? Sounds let's good. Do it. All right, let's get to it. So guys, whenever I'm talking to really experienced traders, I always get a very common question from the masses. They want to know, what made you decide to be a trader in the first place? Lance, how'd you get your start in trading? Sure, so I think the biggest factor for me was I read the series called The Market Wizard Books. And these interviews with top famous traders, you learn that there were just so many different styles, so many different ways to beat the market. And when you're in college and you're learning that, uh, according to academia, it might not even be possible to beat the market, it was such a contrast to what I had read in those books. And I thought to myself, man, like, I want to see if I can beat that challenge. It seemed like a very good gauntlet to, to try out. That's a, that's a very good way to get a start, right? Yeah. Those books are actually well, very and, good. And fortunately for us, uh, you can actually beat the market, which makes it even better. Otherwise, that's you awesome. Otherwise, be here. Greg, I know you're a fan of the Market Wizards books. Did that have any uh, role in what you, how I, you became? No, I did not read those until years later, to be honest. Um, so no, that, I mean, when I started, I, I didn't exactly start uh, set out to be a trader per se. It's more like I started out trying to make some money. Right. <laughs> <And> <laughs> like it's all. I mean, you know, of course it was a dream, but that wasn't the actual, like the goal in front of me was to make some money. And I started making more money by trading than what I was doing at the time, so I became Which was? building swing sets. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Glad you changed that. Uh, I was that wondering if we were going to throw that in there. <laughs> Nate, I know that a lot of people have heard your story, but why don't you refresh us? Like, what, what made it click for you? Like, what did you, uh, what made you decide to do this? Uh, it was more the entrepreneurial spirit. You know, you don't want a boss, you want to kind of do your own thing. Um, I don't like the idea of working for somebody. I think, you know, any. I'm a hard worker as is, and if, uh, the harder you work, you're building somebody else's dream uh, when you could do it yourself. So I think um, trading brings a lot of that, uh, and uh, it's something where you can't master it. You can definitely get better at it, uh, but you can continually find better ways, fine tune it, and uh, it's something that's that, absolutely uh, true. You're never done. Yeah, you're never done. <laughs> it, that's good and bad, um, but reality is, is you can keep on going and. Um, find better ways and, and here we are. I mean, we're, some of us, uh, I know Lance had ridiculous 20, 20, 2020, 2021, along with many others, um, numbers that you never really thought were possible and uh, it's life changing for a lot of, a lot of people. So you, know, you can only do so much with that. And I think, you know, think about coming here today, why we're here. And I know you wanted to talk a little bit about the charity kind of angle um, but I think it's there's only so much fulfillment that you can get out of trading of course so I think it's uh, I know Lance you're doing uh, impact competition yeah and I think I think for a lot of people especially because the job can be just so insular be lot behind a computer screen you start to want to expose yourself to 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 different areas and say like how can I give back and how can I uh, use some of my success and parlay that into anything that benefits the greater community at large. And I think that's something that, that Nate, Greg, and myself, we all share those values of, of, of giving back, and I'd love to hear why it's important to them. Well, I mean, for one thing, though, I mean, every, we, we deal with, everything we deal with is just money, and it's, it's very hard to contribute back to your community or the world at large, you know, in, in a personal way. It's not like we're teachers or working for the community we're just sitting there behind a desk so getting involved in charity for someone who wants to you know, somehow contribute back to the world in a way it's it's to, to me it's an obvious outlet 
before that. Um, and what was your question or your? <laughs> yeah, no, and just just that desire to give give back and 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 whether it's for traders for a cause or or. Well, it's other also people. partially to give what you're doing some more meaning. You know, is it just about buying a house, a car, you know, whatever the fancy trips? I mean, you know, it, enriching your own life. Of course, it's nice, but it, it's not. There's not a lot of depth to that meaning in that lifestyle. You want you want to feel like you're some part of something bigger. It's a question that I ask a lot: is is what what motivates you to get up in the morning? You guys are to the point in your careers where you don't need to trade anymore. You, like you're beyond that. So, what is it that's bringing you the fulfillment? What is it that's bringing you back every day? You guys, I know that you're both semi-retired from trading, but you still kind of go back and do it a little bit here and there, right? So. Searching for like a, a deeper meaning, I think, is what, where you're going with that, right? Yeah, like and, to... and honestly, it, it, it really does sometimes come to my mind when I'm trading. Like, you know, it's like, do I need to make more money? But um, the ability to give, knowing that that financial impact on what I'm giving to is, you know, significant enough to make a difference to me is, um, you know, valuable enough to, um, you know, to motivate me to, you know, to keep going when there's a, a good opportunity there. I think for a lot of people, what, what drives them with trading is that trading can be such a good microcosm for improving yourself and who you are as a person. And then being able to use some of that success to pivot and help other people be their best selves. Uh, I, I think, and, I, and a lot of the research even just backs it nowadays, that sustained happiness really can come from giving back and, and helping others and of course, we all would definitely agree like you got to cover your means first and trading provided a, a hell of a living but then it's what, what can i do for others and yeah i think it's important to be clear here obviously i don't think any of us started trading you know with charity in mind but you get to that point where you know the next big score feels great of course personally but it's not enriching your life or changing your life in any meaningful way so it feels good to be to still have a, you know a higher purpose that you're contributing towards. I think a lot of people don't even realize the importance of it. And I think Greg was a mentor in a sense to me when, you know, we did these traders for a cause, you start to find out how much of a percentage he actually gives each year. And, you know, I always donated, but it was never to the extent that I do now. And I think just by networking and meeting those people and seeing uh, the importance of it for him uh, starts to kind of, you know, brush off on myself for one, as well as many other traders. I think and if you were to ask anyone, any everyone had some type of mentor that greatly contributed to their success or set the example of giving back and helping others. And I think most people that have, have achieved a lot, they recognize that they couldn't have, couldn't have done it alone and they want to help others uh, succeed and be the example that, that others had set for them to allow their success. Well, there, there are a lot of things in this world, you know, if you watch the news or you know, just pay attention that, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of just sad shit going on, you know, like there's a lot of stuff and most of us feel hopeless, helpless, you know, to make a difference. And granted, we're barely even a drop in the bucket at all with what we're doing, but it still feels good to, you know, when you see all the negativity of the world and, you know, all the problems to feel like at least in some way, somehow, Making a difference. You know, I mean, you're making an impact that might only be, you know, a few people out of millions or billions, you know, but yet it's, it is a difference. What I, what I think people forget is, first of all, there's three ways to give back. Three main ways. Time, money, or wisdom. And my view has always been that everyone can do one of those in some form. And people always want to wait for some other person, uh, you know, some billionaires from this person or that person, someone with more time. There's always an excuse if you allow it. And I think what really happens, you finally just turn inward and say like, why not me? Yep. Regardless of what level you're at or anything else, there is some way you can help others. And what the world needs is every single person to be accountable to themselves and, and do that. I think, I think you realize too, like you can give 1% or 10% of, you know, whatever you make and it doesn't change your life. And I, I don't think a lot of people realize that. It's not going to cause you not to be able to go out to dinner. It's not going to be able to cause you to not do something else, but it's going to make a, a much bigger difference somewhere else.
Tell me about a big loss that you took trading and how you recovered from it. Well, Zach, um, I, I've had many big losses, yes. plenty to talk about. Um, I'll go back to what would be my first really large loss. Um, when I first started trading, my first year, the stock was Metrocom, MCOM. Um, Percentage-wise, it was well over 50%. I don't remember the exact number, but it was- Of your account value? Yes. Wow. Yes. And I mean, this is, my account's obviously less. It was, my account just got over six figures, and then I took this loss. So it was a huge wake-up call in so many ways because, you know, once you get the ball rolling and you hit six figures, you think you're good. And all of a sudden you realize, wow, you know, like this is, you know, there's some real risk here and some real danger. And, you know, um, I, I don't want to act like I was complacent heading into it, but I was starting to become, you know, a bit complacent and, and a bit too comfortable, too confident. But um, my mind goes back to that point in part because every time you have a big loss, there are certain things that are the same, even all the way back to the first one. And one of them is, um, you know, when that happened to me, you know, I doubled down on fundamentals, like you know, the fundamentals of trading, not fundamental, stock fundamentals. But, you know, you have to think, you know, think about what got you to where you were. And instead of trying to make your money back, try to, you know, get your skills back. You know, do what was working before and get your head out of the financial side of it. And, and the reason why I responded that way even back then before I'd experienced is because, you know, I was still in that time period where I wasn't sure if I was a trader yet. You know, I mean, I was really trying to figure out if, like, this was, if I was going to be able to do this for a living or if this was just, uh, you know, like a, a, a thing because, you know, we were in the dot-com bubble. So, you know, there was a sense that this wasn't just an infinite thing, you know. And, um, you know, so, so I really wanted to think, like, well, if I really want to give this a go as a trader, then I got to make it work. And, and the focus was not on I have to make it back or I have to make X amount of money. It was I have to make it work, you know, make the profession work, make, you know, the, the process work, the, make the system work, which, you know, essentially is what I was doing in the beginning is I was really trying to make a, a system out of, you know, my, myself, my trading. And, you know, all my focus went right back to those, you know, basics and fundamentals. And um, you know, that happened I think early July, you know, so it was like a two or three month period of just really slowly, very slowly, you know. I mean, I did start making money right away, but slowly, you know, incrementally. It was, it was a confidence builder and, um, you know, by the time winter rolled around, the markets got really hot and the timing was perfect because I got my confidence back right when the markets picked up and, you know, the rest is history. Did you have to make like, a lot of changes to your risk tolerance and like your, you know? No, you because I was doing it right before that happened. Okay. You know what I mean? So I had to go back to what I was doing right. The problem was, as I started to, you know, diverge from what I should have been doing, you know, there, I mean, there were a lot of little mistakes. As most bad tr trades, just about every bad trade I've ever made, it always starts off as, you know, nothing out of the ordinary. You know, you, you think it's a good opportunity. You think, you know, you're just, doing the same old but there's something about it that's different that you didn't identify early on and then once you get knee deep you know you start doing things wrong because you know you're adjusting way too late right and it was just one of those scenarios where you know everything started going way off course you know, before i was really fully cognizant of you know how bad this was you know i just thought i mean i, I don't know i mean I, I had no idea going into that trade that it was about to become a disaster which is never the case it became a massacre <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But but looking back, it was so obvious, you know. So so looking back, it was just one of those things of like, yeah, don't do that, you know. <laughs> don't don't screw up. This and, didn't work. I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> so so the adjustments are actually small, but they're all just vital components of good trading. You know, they're they're not like gigantic changes you have to make. It's I mean, obviously if if, you, if you're blowing up for the wrong reasons, but I mean if you're just slowly diverging and. You know, it's just all these small little things adding up that suddenly become a big problem. Well, you just have to focus on those small things that got you there. Totally makes sense. What about you, Nate? I think that's the, the biggest thing is people think they need to make a gigantic change after a loss, and you don't. You just need to go right back to what was, you know, working before. You look back and you see how far you've come. It was working. You just made a mistake, and a lot of people end up trying to uh, fix it with that one Hail Mary pass and I'm gonna make it all back and it's gonna be good but it, 
it's not the way it happens. But uh, I know a lot of people have heard my story with Kodak. Uh, there's been plenty of, of others, AMC. Um, but uh, I really think uh, there's, there's like two main things probably. Um, one is that uh, the market that always is, is taking, it also gives. So the faster you can get back to that equilibrium point and back to where you were yesterday, the day before, or whatever, um, you know, you're going to be able to uh, trade how you were consistently and, and fix that. Uh, and it just takes time. Uh, a lot of people want to fix it tomorrow, uh, but this is not the way, the way that it works. The other thing that I think that a lot of, um, a lot of my losses, uh, and, and you kind of talked about it a little bit, but you know, don't do that again. But like you, you knew probably four, five, seven, ten times that like I should be out right now. I, I, oh, I probably shouldn't be here. <laughs> I, I, I should have stopped it. I should have done this. Yeah. And you have to listen to that. And any time that I, I get even that that small like feel yeah, that, of that, exactly I might the, size the, down. That moment of that small little mistake. It's yes. not. It, you didn't start off with this big horrible trade. It started with this stupid little it mistake. It all snowballs. Yeah. So do you rationalize it? That's the it? moment when do you, you can get just out. say it's okay because. This, you still have time at that point because what happens is if most people are probably thinking the same thing and that's when those moves start to really compound. So if you have size, you still have time when those first kind of moments you're like, maybe I shouldn't be here. You have time, but it's when you run out of time that everybody's doing the same thing and the move starts to just get way out of You have this moment where you, you're giving back two weeks of your, you know, the last two weeks worth of your trading and you're like, oh my God, you know, I just spent you know, 50 hours times 200 hours of trading, yeah. all that work, it's all gone. So, 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 so you get that moment of like, yeah. you, you can't give it up. And then it becomes six months or years worth of trading. Exactly. It's the anchoring bias. And, and one thing I think that was so relatable for me is really, well, far from being my biggest overall loss, uh, very early on in my career, my biggest loss was, was Allergan and that almost ended my career. Uh, and what happened was I was short on an imbalance into uh, a Friday end of the day or something like that. And then news came out that at Ackman was doing a reverse hostile takeover of the stock. I had offers in, so instantly before I could even process the news, I got short more. And then it's after hours, so there's no liquidity to get out. And so what you perceived as being this impossible, unfathomable move, then occurred. And at least with that case, I did end up taking my loss. And I just remember thinking exactly what you said, where it's like, I don't care whether, I don't care about being the biggest trader in the world. I don't care about making all this money. All I care about is I hope this wasn't the end because I just want to have some type of career, this job. I love this and I just want to make it. And I hope this doesn't put me out of the race. And, and I think sometimes some of those losses might even desensitize you in, in a good way, right? Because yeah. you, you start to realize like, if, if you lose a six figure loss, you're not gonna start sweating the 500 bucks or the thousand bucks. And you start to think bigger and you start to think smarter. And, and one thing I've always tried to impress on people is thinking about the five year game or the 10 year game. And I would just say to myself like, Lance, like look, this is just a, ju this is just a blip. If you're gonna actually succeed at this job, this, this hundred something loss might be enormous and unfathomable now, but in the long term, if you're gonna succeed this, this will never have mattered under any time frame. And so like all I thought about was Lance, like focus on the tenure, focus on the big picture, go right back to the process. You're not a bad trader. Like nothing, nothing fundamentally changed about me. It was one fluke or one mistake. And I think like one of the most important things is for people to recognize like one bad trade does not a bad trader make. And that's one of my favorite sentences because everybody has mistakes. We're discretionary human traders. And if you think that changes anything about your record, especially if you've been doing this for years, you need to go back and say, look, I've been here before and I, I am a good trader and I need to go back to the basics like Nate was saying. Yeah, I think the desensitization is important too because I've noticed that, you know, each huge loss that I've taken coming back, not only do you get the comp, like I've been here before, I can do it. I, I know what I'm doing, but the day to day, it, you're you're very much disconnected after that, yep. and you allow trades to breathe, which is important. You have to let trades work, and uh, I think it's propelled my career. After, as odd as it sounds, having these major you losses. stop thinking small. You yeah. think, how can I just grow and be bigger, and how can yeah. I become a more robust trader? And I think every trader that's anyone, like you, only became someone by taking those losses, fixing that that little flaw in your yep. system, and becoming better.
Yep. And that's what trading is. Trading is evolution, I think. Yeah, you, you can't separate losses from trading. Like, in, in, in other words, if you want to be a trader, you don't have a choice. It's you have in to the job it's description. going to that's, happen. Yep, that's yeah. what I always say. And, and even though there are preventable losses, what's not preventable is there are always going to be things that happen. You know, like, th th that's how your Allergan example, I mean, I think that's perfect because I've had so many scenarios, like most of them are not like my biggest loss ever, but plenty of scenarios similar to that. Just stupid little things. You left orders in and something yeah. moves on you. And, and it's a classic way though where a small mistake, if you want to call it a mistake in that case, you know, it suddenly blows up in, on your face and you could either get out now or you know, let it mushroom and become. Yeah, and I think like, especially when we were talking about how mistakes can compound and they snowball, like I think people can be too hard on themselves and say, oh man, why didn't I just get out in that first moment? But that is part of being human. And like, yeah. there's advantages to being human. And there are times when discretion helps you. And there's times where like, you mess up, like like willpower is, is fallible. And like, you must not beat yourself up because it's just not productive, right? And like, and so, and, and one thing uh, that Mike Bellafiore has always been great about saying is like, look, you take a big loss, you have, you have 24 hours to complain, mope, whatever about it. After that 24 hour mark, like it's go time. Like yeah. the, past is, the past is history. The only thing you can change is the present and the future. Yeah. Let it go and, and I'll only focus on, on getting better. There's yes. nothing carrying like a negative bias into the next day that's gonna be positive for you. Yep. You gotta just move on and reset, refocus. And you can't next. ever be scared. Done. You can't well, ever I, be scared. I think in a similar, um, a similar issue is that a lot of traders attach their self-worth, their personal value to yep. their performance. Yeah, that's so when you a take great a bad topic. loss, yep. you're not just losing money, you're also losing self-esteem, confidence. Yep. I mean, you know, and I mean, I hate to say it, but you know, after a bad loss, like you're going to be depressed. Yeah, it's like it's not like even if you've been doing this for 20 years, it's not just like you brush like, oh, yeah, I've been through this and I'm fine. Like you still have to process it's emotional it's it's traumatic in many cases absolutely. like as a trader what really matters is like as a trader to be good it is part of your identity full stop if you're a good trader it is your identity it is who you are and so when you take such a big setback like that it is an affront on who you are as a person and i think like that's also where it's so important to recognize like again you're not who that trade says you were and also just having diverse interests. And also like one of the best things ever is just being able to, again, give back and help others. And I, I remember I took this, this big loss uh, when I was in Chicago and I, I went to just walk it off and called it quits for the day. And I saw this, this homeless person with the sign and he said, smile, your best day, uh, your worst day is my best day. And it's so true, like there I was, again, it's super depressing. It just rocks your psychology. And then it just gives you the perspective of like, hey, like. I will get past this. I'm the most fortunate person on earth, even if I don't get past this. And I have so many things to be grateful for. And I think going back to gratitude, going back to friends, family, other interests, uh, it's, it's so important. And, and if you can help others in those moments, it, it really just grounds you. I think we can wrap this subject and move on. Well, I, I wanted, you wanted to say something, because your homeless um, comment, the guy at the sign, reminded me of a, a time when I was on the road um, trading. I brought the laptop and I was actually in Vegas and um, I, I ended up taking a nasty drawdown, which is the worst when you're also on the road. Like, I mean, it's just, you know, you're, you're, you don't have all the normal resources yeah. and it's just yeah. like everything's just getting worse and worse. And I had one of those moments where just like at the peak of the drawdown, this is like a midday drawdown. It's like things are going parabolic, and I went in too short, you know, too early on, on the short side. So I was taking, you know, it's just fortunately a lot of it recovered. But in that moment, you know, it was just like, you know, you can't even look at the numbers anymore. <laughs> but I stepped out of the hotel room. It, it was like, um, it wasn't like a high rise. It was just like, a, I don't know what it was, like a two or three story. You know, we just walk right out. It's like more, more like a motel type of place. Um, but not, <laughs> I don't know if I'm describing this right, but. <laughs> So you but stayed I, in a motel. <laughs> <laughs> Were you the homeless a, person? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Soon to be if, if things got worse. I walked you out, out on the balcony of the sh homeless shelter. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and, and it was uh, there was this big empty lot next door to the hotel. You know, because in Vegas you have these lots where they're getting doing dark. the next project. <laughs> There's like a storm uh, drainage ditch with water in it, and this homeless lady like was washing her clothes in this storm water 
and, and it's like one of these moments of like, you know, I've got problems, but holy shit. Yeah. Like, Perspective. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, it just, I mean, it was just so eye-opening in the moment. You it's know? the right time for you to see that too. It, it's just, my heart went out to her and it also, you know, made me like stop feeling sorry. It's yeah. like, you know, I can lose money and I still Today the sucks, but it's not that bad. Yeah. <laughs> can and always be worse. In a similar way, we're on the site of the Boston Massacre. Five people died at this historic event. I mean, I don't care how bad your drawdown is, your broker's not gonna come and kill you. There's you only know? thing, there's, at the end of the day, there's one thing that matters and that's life. And, and being yeah. able to experience all the beauty of it. And it's, it's so easy otherwise to lose perspective and, and those thoughts and those anecdotes, it brings you back. Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. Guys, we know that trading is an endeavor that you can pour almost every hour of the day into. Easily. How do you maintain a good work-life balance in your trading career? I mean, you have to focus on it. It's probably one of the most difficult things to, uh, to do. You just have to be aware of it and make it a, 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 a focus point, um, especially if you have kids too. I mean, you can, it's very easy to gravitate back towards the office or the computer and, and just go back to work. So um, for me, typically it's uh, you know, focusing on making sure I get up early, uh, at least get a workout in each day, uh, focus on the work and then just shut it off. Uh, because if I don't, it's going to be 10 p.m. and I'll still be on that laptop. Yeah. Well, you, Greg? I, I think um, good work-life balance with trading is very challenging especially when you have kids family I mean um, it, it's one of those things where I can't say I've ever accomplished it while I was actively full-time trading and it's one of, you know you strive for it you have to keep it in mind you, you know it's not I'm not saying throw up your arms and don't try but but also accept the fact that you know you're, you're never there's never enough time in the day right? I mean you know Nate's saying you know you can work till 10 I mean it's I feel the same way and, and, and sometimes I feel like I should be working because there's more to do and yet I'm still cutting it off you know just because you, know, you need to sleep you need to take you need to take care of yourself and um, one of the things I always did uh, started probably 12 13 years ago was uh, take some time off in the summer because if I don't have a forced vacation like you know where, where I turn off the screens walk away and just literally take time away, not, not right. even paying any attention. Uh, like, even if I take a peek at it, you know, I'm yeah. back in. You know, I have to take that break, and that's, that's one way I, I sort of created some work-life balance, because um, I don't know how to do it. If I'm, you know, if I'm trading the way I really want to trade, you know, then all my focus becomes on you know, the commitment to being the best trader I can, and that means I'm working long hours, getting up real early, and um, you know, so certain things I will uh, try to make sure I do, like exercise. But there are plenty of other things in life that kind of get pushed off. Yeah. You know. Do you think that's the nature of of just being a trader and, and the business? The fact that you can keep sinking more and more time into it, and it's almost infinite how much you could put into it. I think it's the nature of just trading in general. Yeah, I think that's what's so hard is, is like Nate mentioned, there's literally an infinite opportunity set of, of new plays, charts you could study, things you could do, uh, news stories you could read, watch lists you can create. And I do agree with them that it's just not a forgiving job. I think to be great or to just even get past the learning curve, like the earlier on you are, you really need to be eating, breathing, sleeping, trading and that needs to be one of your single-minded focuses and the the thing though kind of the paradox though is sometimes if you want to be your best you also need to keep in mind what that means right and so if you're staying up all night reviewing charts and not sleeping you need to realize that's counterproductive right, right. so I would say putting all the time you can especially early on in your career while still getting sleep while still having some semblance of, of a balanced social life, while still being able to hit the gym, exercise, meditate, do all the things that help you perform, um, 
but then eventually, yeah, try to work work balancing, which is which I'm sure if, if you're trying to be one of the best, it's it's really, really, really hard because uh, you know there isn't any off season. The game is always changing. Uh, the competition's always getting better, and if you want to be the best, you really need to put it in and keep up. And I think that's where where rules help and saying uh, at a certain point in your career, like, look, I'm not willing to trade past 5 p.m. I'm not willing to trade pre market before. 9 a.m. And, and start to put constraints on once you've kind of achieved what you need to because otherwise it, it can be really consuming. Well, there are endless opportunities in the market and, and you could just expand and trade every strategy there is. So you almost have to put blinders on to a degree and you know mind your own rules, only trade setups and, and the type of strategy that you are focused on. Otherwise, you'll just You'll never, you'll never run out of you'll it. Never you know, you'll never end. So much of this conversation is going to depend on what kind of stuff you trade. And Nate and I, I sorry Lance, I don't know if, if this is the same for you, but for a lot of the momentum stocks and you know, the, these you know, low float stocks, um, you know, when you have a position overnight, and maybe it, you don't do it as much as I have, but you know, like if you have a large position overnight, like, I don't have the choice. I gotta get up early because crap's happening super early, and, and stuff's happening after hours. And you gotta manage it. You can't walk away. You don't have it, it, the choice is gone. And that's one thing. It has not always been that way. You know, just ten or fifteen years ago, the pre-market and after-hours session was not you know, something you really had to worry about. Going on now, it's four a.m. I mean, yeah. depending on the position. Well, so, well, one big thing is I think you can choose what trade-offs you want to make and whether you want to play that game. And, and yeah, 2020, 2021, like there were, there were some exceptional times where it's just too profitable not to play it. But then at, at a certain point and a certain point in your career, you need to say, um, are these overnights, like speaking for myself, uh, if I had a meaningful overnight position on, I don't care how stoic you think you are, it affects your sleep, even subconsciously. And you might you might say, look, if, if something bad happens, uh, I'm not waking up before eight, I just accept that risk. Your brain and subconscious doesn't say that. Yeah. You're, you're waking up throughout the night, you're waking up at 5 a.m., you're waking up at 6 a.m. And the other thing I realized too was, was those wake-ups and those poor nights of sleep also affected my day-to-day -day trading. So yeah. you need to factor those costs in and eventually say like, look, if, if I'm trying to optimize for, for health, happiness, not be moody and grouchy all day, you know, maybe that, that P&L trade-off, um, unless it's exceptional, just isn't there. And, and so that was one thing that I really started to, to do as well. Sometimes it even starts earlier because if you wake up 320, 330, you're like, ah, it's almost four. So I'll might as well not go to bed now. Yeah, you can't fall back asleep. <laughs> right. But one of the biggest things that I, I do sometimes hold overnight now, um, but not any size compared to like an intraday size. And, and that's just by choice. And, and most of the time I, I don't hold over just because something's bound to happen on one of them. And then it goes, that's it's the not time. Worth the stress. If I'm going to be working, you know, from 6 a.m., 7 a.m. to 4, and then I want to disconnect or play with my kids or, or whatever, then you got to text something's moving. Then what happens? You've got your phone and now you're disconnected from your kids. So it's, it's a choice. Everybody's different. And I think one of the other things you were saying about uh, younger, uh, and I think a lot of people want to compare and be like somebody else that they see. Oh, that person's crushing it. But totally different lifestyle. You've got two kids or, you know, everybody's different. But at a younger age, 20, 22, 25, you have no debt, you have no risk, no nothing. Just go for it. And We've seen a lot of elite performers come out in that age group, and uh, you know people want to be like them, but they don't take into account their own situation. The sacrifice, and people don't see or they're not aware of the sacrifice. I mean, the amount of the amount of years I spent going into the office every single Sunday to review, the amount of times where Monday through Thursday, Sunday through Thursday actually, there would be no social events at night, right? It was, I need to be in bed by 10, I need to uh, be well rested, I need to do my evening review. Like clockwork, there are no exceptions. And and that comes at it at, at an opportunity cost, socially, um, uh, emotionally, everything. Like you, there are real sacrifices uh, to success and, and everyone needs to say like, what is the price you are willing to pay? Yeah. Coming back to the original question about I mean, the whole thing comes down to trade-offs. Yeah. Every little thing, it's, there's a trade-off involved. And as committed as you are, you can, you're never going to be 100% what you want to be, you know, but how much are you willing to trade off in order to achieve, you know, your goals? And I think that's what it comes down to, and that's, you know... It's a career-long pursuit in trading. I mean, you're never going to be perfect, and 
continually striving to be better at your craft, I think is a big part of the equation for sure. I think there's a little bit of similarity too. You were mentioning like, oh, this billionaire will make this donation. You know, that, that's fine. Why, not, why do I have to do it? And then you actually do it yourself. You always see like everybody else putting fitness first or this first or this first. At some point you have to put it first yourself. You have to actually take a hold of and it. And be true it. to your values and, and be introspective and, and know that, yeah, when you're 23, 24, 25, uh, that incremental dollar so that you're not hunting sewer rats in the New York City subways, <laughs> like that's when it matters. But like at a certain point you need to say like, hey, like I, I care about sleep, I care about hitting the gym. Um, I care about more balance, and it's 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 always something that that to this day I'm sure for all of us, especially you guys with kids, it's 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 a real decision that never stops. Yeah, for for me, typically I need to like make some sort of plan that involves leaving the house. Like today, no problem. I know I'm going to leave and come out to Boston. That's fine. I plan for that. But if it's something just hanging around the house and I had a good morning, I'll gravitate back towards the desk. So for me, I know personally, I need to get out <laughs> clean cut yeah. clean break. and then and then I'm good and I, I could take the day off but if I'm around the house you know where to find me. <laughs> <laughs> cool thanks guys I look back on what we've built over the last, what has it been, eight, eight nine years? Yep. And uh, being here and getting this honor, getting this award, it's like surreal to me. I, I was thinking about it. Um, you know, you don't do it for recognition, obviously. Sure. But, you know, when we were up there, uh, when, when I was at the event, uh, I think it was two years ago or so, I was like, that would be cool to receive that honor at some point because that means that we've, it's confirmation that we're, we're doing, doing something what right. We, what we set out to do. And uh, then flash forward a few years later. Here we are. And, and I think the, the cool part about it is it's, it is making that major impact. Um, you know, it, it, may, it may be small checks here and there, but I, I think looking back at when Myra first kind of joined the team, she kind of saw like dedication, desire that we all kind of had and saw the potential with what we're doing. And uh, here, like I said, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> it's incredible uh, how far we've come. When I think about the fact that you and I were at a penny stocking conference in Vegas and we like I remember this like it was yesterday we sat yeah. down for breakfast and we started like literally jotting things down on a napkin like the idea the, con the well, concept everything we liked about it everything we yeah. did and how we could have a, a better um, how we could better do it better conference. yeah 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 and rather than do it for uh, profit do it for a cause do it for uh, change do it for benefit of something else and the rest is history we really I mean after COVID I would say once we went virtually and I mean I thought it was kind of insane last year when we went back to Vegas and we literally sold out in 24 hours <laughs> yeah I know <laughs> you're like no no we didn't and I'm like yeah we did <laughs> I'll never forget that text message <laughs> Guys, we're sitting here in front of Paul Revere's house. Paul Revere was a guy in American history that marched to the beat of his own drum. What do you guys feel about comparing your own performance to other traders? And what do you like as far as surrounding yourself with people who can make you better? Do you like getting differing viewpoints that are counter to your strategy? Or do you like talking to guys that are kind of like in the same boats so that you have a better barometer for your own performance? This was Paul Revere the Beatle. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I think with uh, with a lot of that, early on, you absolutely want to be seeking outside opinions, right? 
And until you form your identity and your views and you're super concrete on what you're looking for, um, it's so, so valuable to have mentorship. And I think one of the most important things is uh, when you're new, you need those opinions to help frame your lens of viewing things. And like, I mean, did you guys have people that, that helped shape your lens when, when you guys were learning? Not at all. Really? Really. Wow. It was all self-taught. I, I um, definitely could see the value of it. At the same time, um, I, I think there's also value in, you know, not being, um, you know, not following others, you know, because, um, I mean, you know, if you rely too much on someone, obviously it's going to be hard, you know, to, uh, to develop yourself, you know, and you're always, I, mean, I think there are a lot of people that, um, lean too much on services and you know other you know traders uh, chat rooms I don't know I've, I've heard there are these things that <laughs> 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 but but seriously I mean it, it, and of course I think Nate could attest to it it's like you know the, the best ones that come out of that group are the ones who um, who don't rely on the service you know who, who use it as scanner use it as a, a, a tool to, to find potential for that day, that month. So, 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 of course, it's a good thing. It's a positive. But on the other hand, there are people that just become, you know, it's, it's like a crutch or they're too suffer or they are too reliant yeah. on it indefinitely. Like they never really become a, a trader um, in their own right. Um, so, I mean, for me, it just worked out well, you know, because I, I, I just. You would know, you ever factor it. anyone else's opinions in like or do, is there any other like elite traders though that you would you would ask like oh are you interested in this as well or are you solely operating alone um i mean over the years i you know i have networked um i mean it, it's almost 10 years into my trading career till i really actually connected with other people that are doing similar things as me um i mean i knew they were out there but i just wasn't really um communicating with them um i mean these days i, I would say I do far more of it than ever um, yeah. but you know I think it's important to, to be select with who you you know associate with who you talk to because you know there are a lot of people um, I mean just for example I guess you know like th there are people on Twitter who you would think are really good traders and they're not you know and it's just like you're following their advice or even if you're just talking to them it's like you know you're not I mean is, is someone really a mentor if they're not that good it's hard to really decipher sometimes Mm -hmm. even who you should be following. Yeah. Nate, Nate, what was your experience like? Uh, I definitely had mentors way back with OTC, but like Greg, NASDAQ, when, it, when OTC kind of stopped working, uh, the NASDAQ was all self-taught. I think there's a lot of inspiration, you know, by seeing people, for example, Greg, you know, making these ridiculous trades, uh, showing you what's actually possible in you know, different listed exchanges. Um, but there was never anybody that, you know, I followed or that I, um, you know, kind of uh, would say it was like a one mentor. It's more about just kind of pulling from all these different kind of avenues and finding out what the best is for you, the best version of yourself or the best you you can be. So um, aside from the mentorship, which I obviously is, is very important when you're developing as a trader, what do you use as a as a uh, a barometer for your own personal development, other than your P and L? Like, do you, do you share notes with other traders that have a similar strategy, so that you can figure out if what you're doing is in line with what's working? Well, well, one thing that I will say on that is is like an area that I think is unequivocally beneficial is having people that trade bigger than you and they open your mind to what's possible. Because right. I think none of us, if we operated in a full vacuum without knowing uh, P&Ls or sizes or, or, or skill levels of other traders, we never would have reached or jumped as high without that. And um, then where I think might also be true is everybody has their own style set, but I started, later in my career really collaborating with 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 others which i otherwise hadn't done so much and 
I ended up becoming of the mindset that one plus one really can equal three. And I regret not having done a lot of that sooner because whether it's collaborating on strategies, whether it's collaborating uh, on write-ups or, or different styles, uh, there's so many things you miss out on. And I think as a trader, especially if you're someone that's operated alone for a while, while like, like Greg or even myself, um, people can be very protective of, of their trading strategies and of their knowledge. And until you're willing to take the risk and trust somebody and, and give something without getting anything back, um, you're hesitant to do so. But once you do it with the right people, I found that you get so much value in return. And I never would have been the trader I, I became without this. And you know, one, one, one great example is, is, is Mike Bellafiore introduced me to an independent trader in, in San Diego. And I've tweeted about this, and this is this is someone that I'm 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 more advanced than, and and I was simply mentoring and helping out, and I didn't expect to get anything back. And he trades mostly futures, but he got me watching all these futures contracts that I otherwise wouldn't have been watching, and that led to one of my best trades this year. And so, so many times you'd say, "Oh, there's nothing I can give in return," but it's not true. You know, there's always so much value that can be exchanged, and even even just like all of us getting together, like we all have so much to learn from each other, and that wouldn't be possible without without the network. Yeah, I think it's it's important to surround yourself with people that are uh, smarter in different avenues. You've got like a biotech guy, you've got a fundamental guy, maybe me for technical. Uh, but when you kind of put that all together, like you said, one plus one equals three. I mean, there's just so much more value that you get having a, a concrete you know answer with what this really means first okay i read the pr it said it was positive is it really positive no it's not bio guy says it's not should have been higher even though it is positive it's not really and that's something that maybe i wouldn't know if i didn't have you know if i hadn't surrounded myself with smarter people in different areas uh, I, th I think you said um you know if it's the right people yes, I, I think that's, exactly. that's really what yeah. it comes down to you know yeah. i mean I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I definitely would have done better, but that's the key point. It's not because you surround yourself with people. It's it's got to be the right people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And people that are willing to give back, um, also selflessly, and and have the same interest. Because a lot of when there's money involved, like people can can turn turn vicious real quick, yeah. and people end up so protective. And one. One mindset I always try to have with anything in life is, is never act from a position of scarcity. And whether it's scarcity for money, scarcity for ideas, scarcity uh, for, for means and well-being, like always operate as if you have extra, you give. And, and if, again, if, if you act, I think like justly and, and rightfully, like, yeah, like there, there'll be bad people out there, but there's also a lot of good people. And once you connect with those people, just magic happens. I think it's very common among traders to, to have that scarcity mentality. I think it's one of the reasons why our organization is so important in trying to teach them the importance of philanthropy and giving back and altruism. Because as a trader, a lot of them go, they, they'll go on a tear, they'll do really well, and then they'll blow up. So they tend to cling to what they have. And what we need to teach them is that they have the ability to give more and to make a bigger difference. What's funny too is one thing I've learned to do just as, as a little quirk of, of mine is after a big loss, I do two things. I treat myself to a really, really nice meal and I donate. And it, so, it sounds silly and corny because, but it really does at a visceral level say two things. I still live enough and more than I need to have a nice meal and provide for myself. And number two, even after this loss, I still have enough excess where I can make somebody else's life better. And you think like, again, this isn't, it, it truly is the belief that by those actions, I'm getting more out of it. Like I end up with more as a result of doing that. And it's very paradoxical and people don't believe it. People don't believe in sharing. People don't believe in giving. People don't believe in all these things un until they do it. And like even, even, coming up here like I, I, I complimented Nate because Nate is always so good with with his networking and and the introductions and the rela relationships and just the value you get from that is so so enormous and I don't think you realize that until you see people being just exemplar models of it I think I mean that's why we're also all here right me and uh, Greg met at a uh, conference in Vegas uh, one year and then ended up meeting Zach through that 
And then we ended up creating our own. Then we ended up meeting Mike Bellafieri. And then we ended up meeting you through him. And I mean, it's just a constant cycle of networking and meeting new people and how can you better yourself from all these different people. Yep. Cool. Thanks, guys. So did you guys have a moment in your trading journey where you realized I can do this and I can be successful and make a, a career out of trading? Yeah, I mean, speaking at least for me, uh, it was a long struggle where the first year I didn't even have a single positive month. And a lot of it, it wasn't that I conceptually didn't get it. I understood everything, but just acting in real time was really hard where everything just moved so fast and there were always nuances and everything was never the same but it always rhymed and when I was really starting to interview elsewhere uh, there was this this set up this exhaustion gap pattern in Tesla and this was one of those things where I had playbooked the trade I knew that this was one of the better setups I knew it was a very very high probability one and this was like the first time where I knew like look Lance like you might not get another opportunity this this good all month or all year and if you're running out of time this is the time to really go for it and sure enough the play worked out well um, I made multiples of whatever my best trade was prior to that and that really bought like a whole new new leash on life for me and it and I think so much ends up being these feedback loops where if you really get a certain play down and you can master it you can then start to string together some positive days and you can build on that and, and have motivation and it can really change the course of, of your career just because it gives you uh, something to stand on and the confidence in yourself that you can do it. What about you, Greg? There are a lot of little moments, you know, I mean, I can pinpoint different um, moments along the career and, and just you know, just as you start trading, obviously there are a lot of pieces that fall into place as, as it comes together. Um, one thing that stands out in my mind is how, um, you know, I was a very technical based trader in the beginning, um, really paid almost no attention to the news and the catalysts, really just focusing so much on the charts. But I had one of these, um, a trading day where there was uh, something that came out on the news stream and, you know, it's just like one of these moments where, you know, you're just kind of following it in the background long enough where uh, it, it just it just clicked. You know, I, I looked at it and I'm like, oh, that stock's going to go up. Like, that's a buy. You know, like, I didn't actually act on it, but I had this enormous amount of confidence on, on something I'd never done before, like never thought about before. But, but you know, like it, it finally soaked in after many years of just paying attention to it in the background. Yeah. And sure enough, it did exactly that, you know. but. It was the uh, aha moment where I realized, you know, there, there's like, I, I could be far more dynamic as a trader than just looking at the charts and the technicals. Like I can start to incorporate other levels of yeah. information. It's just one of those moments like, you know, when you realize that you, you don't have to define yourself as one thing anymore. You know, you can, you can learn and become a multifaceted trader. One, one thing that I actually think is worth adding is people too often view success whereas oh did I make a lot of money in that trade but what people also need to realize is the first step to success and building that skill set up is first being conscious and so like what you just said you said you didn't even execute on that trade but it was in a, a big aha moment and that's because you were conscious of what you needed to do mm -hmm. and so when I'm teaching trainees I say the first step not necessarily to execute on the trade but be aware of, hey, this is a trade opportunity for me. And then the second step, again, isn't trade it, but think about how you would properly structure this trade and what your rules would be. And only then can you begin to execute. And then once you execute, add size. And what really happens is so much becomes uh, a matter of reps and practice. And much like driving a car, the first time you drive a car, it's too much to process. Your brain is trying to process all of it can, but there's too much, right? But eventually it all goes to RAM. And all of a sudden, you know, you can do all these things at once and you can process all these things. And after enough years, you can drive your car while talking on the phone and eating a croissant with your son. I, I love your example because I'm teaching my daughter to drive right now. And just the other day I said to her, like, you know, 
brakes on the left, gas is on the right. But don't worry, it will become second nature. It's like for yep. her, it's like, you know, this is all very overwhelming. It's a lot of information. It's like, you got to think about that yeah. while also looking at the traffic. Like it's... And when there's, when you're trying to read the box and process the intraday chart and the daily chart, for a beginner, there's just no way you're going to be able to do that, right? And, and so I remember when I was building my playbook out onto the category of news, there would be these headlines and it would just happen so quick. And the only way to then get good at it was you just built the reps, you built the reps, you built the reps. And I remember there was this one time, um, there was, I think it was in CYH, there was a headline that they were exploring a sale or something. And the issue though was this company was so indebted and uh, the stock just, just exploded because people hadn't quite processed what the ticker was, some of the characteristics. And I had done so many reps and trained myself to be so fast, where for the first time I realized, wait a second, I know why this is spiking and these people are dead wrong and they're about to figure that out. And I was able to get so, so, so much size on this. And I had this mega, mega chop, but it was only because I had done so many reps on that where I was fa processing it faster than the market. I, I feel like I could relate to exactly what you're saying. There are certain trades where your conviction is so through the roof in, in terms of like, you just know. Like, yep. and, and it, it and comes it's not, from that. it's not intuition. All intuition, like some people say gut feelings and everything else, that is just the, the aggregate of all of your experiences tell you something, right? And it's, it's like, how does, how does Tom Brady know that, that the defense is gonna go rushing in? All those minor cues, he does it from watching the thousands of hours of tape, right? And so I think like at an elite level as a trader, it's your mind that's processed all these nuances about the box, how the stock's reacting, the daily chart, the intraday, all these small nuances. And sometimes you can't even put it into words because it's just so many variables and nuances. Yeah, but so somewhere you've seen it before and, and your brain puts it together and becomes automatic. Yep, yeah. yep, and that's the beauty of just pattern recognition on this job. That's essentially what we do. No matter what style of trader you are, fundamental, like Buffett's recognizing what are the patterns of a good right. moat. Um, no matter what type of trading, it's all the same. It's all pattern recognition. Guys, if you could think of one piece of complete game-changing advice that you could offer to traders, what would it be? Uh, I would, I would say, stop trying to find the top, and uh, you know, stop focusing on the shiny object of the day. Everybody always wants to trade the most volume one, the highest percentage gainer, the the one that everybody's talking about. And if you just take a step back, let everybody else do their thing, let everybody else try to find the top. And what I say a lot is like, let others pay for the information because we've all been there. We short cover, short add cover. And we're essentially paying for that information. Let others do that. Let the exchange come in, let it start to almost exhaust everybody else out first and then come in. And that for me has been a, a big game changer because I'm notably stubborn on the front side of moves. I used to be anyway. And so one of the biggest things was just being patient and letting everybody else do that. Let everybody else be stubborn and then take the rest. Yep. Right. And so for me, one big thing was on some of these down moves being mostly, for a lot of my trading originally, contrarian in nature, um, what I would do is sometimes fade an average down on the front side. And that would open up like all sorts of issues. What if it's potentially news? What if something goes much further than you could have ever imagined? And the whole benefit, supposed benefit, was that if it does turn, you wouldn't be able to get all that stock. And so after a lot of frustration and probably way, way, way too long in my career and too many drawdowns, I finally said like, enough's enough. I don't want whatever p and I'm supposedly making from this, it's not worth the stress and I'm just gonna wait for the turn. And that's where my whole concept about waiting for the right side of the V is the reality is you might even end up with the same price, but one, you have a stop at the low, your probability of success is much better and, and the rewards, you know, just as good. And 
like my whole belief that you might not be able to get the stock was dead wrong. And so I thought this is gonna take away from my aggressiveness, this will take away from my ability to have size. But paradoxically, it was the opposite. Without drawing down, without taking so many losses before the actual turn, this allowed me to be more aggressive when that see it moment did happen. And so sure, there's some illiquid stuff where it might kinda skip and not be a lot of liquidity and you can't get a full position, but in the aggregate, this was the single most effective change in my trading that allowed me to take it to the next step and have higher reward, higher win rates, and not have to suffer those drawdowns. Not to mention, it sounds like it would be a lot less stressful. Oh yeah. A lot less. Yeah. Plus, when that V happens, a lot of times you're actually exiting maybe for flat. You got out of it, you got let out. But if you had just waited, that might be an ad spot for you, which yep, is exactly yep, why yep. you can get that and more so, size. And so the other thing is, like Nate just said, is so many beginners, when they've gone through a bad drawdown or really rotted with a position, they'll be so likely to then take the position off for flat or something. And it's one of those things where it's like that you just went through the pain. Now the turn finally happened and you did that for nothing. Right, right. Lance came in and took all your stock. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Greg? Yeah, sell me. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to a newer trader, someone who's been trading for maybe a year, and um, you know they, they might be struggling to the point where they're break even or they've been losing money, and you know and, and they're fishing for something like you know how can I, you know, how can I be profitable? I want to do this. I want to make a living. I want to make a go at this. Um, and, and often I'll, I'll get to the point of the conversation we'll ask them well you know do, do you ever have trades where you do feel confident where you have conviction do you ever have those you know at, le at least once in a while a really good trade where you know like yeah this is a good one and you know I, I know what I'm doing and you have those moments and, and they always say yes so then then you're like okay well then why don't you just get rid of all the other trades and you'll be profitable <laughs> which, which essentially means you have to sit on your hands but it's very hard mentally because if you think you know I am a trader you start to think to yourself, that means I have to be trading. But that, that's not how it works. You, you don't have to be trading to be a trader. You have to be profitable to be tra a trader. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter you know, if you only trade once a week. If you trade once a week and make 500 bucks, but avoid the other you know, 20 trades that you would have made, which you know, lose an aggregate, you know, the same amount of money, you know, it, 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 that's the entire difference between profitability and, and not being profitable. It has nothing to do with quantity of trades. People really struggle to wrap their heads around that. And, and I mean, it's hard for me too. I mean, there are plenty of times when on a slow day where it's hard for me to pull back, but, but you have to recognize that. It's like, yeah. you're, you're not getting paid just to be active. There's no, you know, no one's going to come and you know, give you a paycheck because you were active that day. I mean, no one cares. It's, this actually came up in, in a recent podcast and it reminded me of the quote that you used in your presentation way back at the Penny Stocking Conference from Jim Rogers where he talks about waiting until the money is just sitting in the mm -hmm. corner and right. he goes and he picks it up. Yep. Kind of like right there, like, right? Yeah, and I would say one, one offshoot of that too is so many people don't understand how skewed your betting needs to be. Uh, I met with, with a trader in LA last week, strong, great trader, but his bet sizing was, was just too uniform across. And the beauty about trading is if you're not paying an ante or anything, and you can just sit on your hands, you can wait until you have those pocket aces. And so many traders out there, they'll, they'll get pocket aces, and they'll get tens, and they'll bet equal on each of those hands, right? Or they'll lose some of their chips on the 10s or, or the 10-8 or something, and then be less positioned to really swing big on those aces. And I think what the best traders do, and I know this is especially true for, for, for Greg, myself, for you, is when something's really, really good, we're not betting 1x, we're not betting 2x or 3x. It is the better the play, the more exponential you're betting. Right. Right. And until you do that, like that one thing allows so much skew in your trading. Like my win percentage was no better than anybody else's, but when there was something really, really juicy and people were betting 2X, I was doing 20X, right? Yeah. And that allowed me to make so many more mistakes. That allowed me to do dumb things. That allowed me to take big rips. That allowed me to uh, have the cushion to not make money for months or years if need be, because when it was really, really good, I bet huge on those moments. I, 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 the way I like to put it is, we're not paid to trade, we're paid to take advantage of opportunities. You can't create an opportunity, so you know, working 10 hours is, is meaningless in our profession. You know, I mean, working as in just being busy. It's, you sit 10 hours waiting for an opportunity and, and striking when the opportunity comes. There's no point in 
I think that's the difference between a lot of newer traders try to create that opportunity, almost force yes, that trade to, sure. to happen versus <laughs> I'm, I'll wait. Like I'm, I'm all set, I'll wait. And that one of the biggest, uh, I would say the second biggest change that I've made is not taking a bias from pre-market. Because there's obviously a lot of pre-market trades that you know you can crush, but you're on the right side of it. And that at 9.30, that could be the complete opposite. So if you're taking that bias, not only do you waste that 9.30, 9.35, you might be there until 4 p.m. I so think um, I always try to like minimize whatever exposure I have going into the open. I, I think this is something important for uh, you know in your room for new subscribers. You know, like when they see all this activity, yeah. I, I think it gives them the wrong impression. I think it's very important for them to understand just because they see right. all these people in the room, you know, and there's like a lot of you know, it, it creates this feeling of like there's just like a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, yeah and, and and almost like you have to participate. It's like, oh my god, I'm missing stuff like crazy. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> yeah. right. That's why I focus on two two names to size into. Basically, I used to try to trade it all and, and size in equally on each one. But if you really zone in and kind of maybe there's not those two opportunities, but at most, typically I try to put most of my <laughs> energy, I guess, towards one to two names. And yes, I will trade more, but it's not going to be my what Main people forget too, focus. right, is they they walk into essentially this casino and there's something like 9,000 casino games out there. And they say, I want to play at all these casino <laughs> games. But the reality is, and this is my analogy, is only out of the 9,000, there only might be 30 of them that are broken and aren't just 51, right. 49. And it's our job to only find those. And now the other thing that people miss is if 20 of them are broken, guess what? 17 of them are only marginally broken. You might be at 60-40, you might be at 70-30, but there's a couple, and maybe not every day, maybe just a couple times a month, but there's a couple that are just spitting out money. And when you find that game, you need to bet so big on that. And here's the thing though, people will struggle and people will wonder why, and why am I break even? Why am I not able to have positive streaks? Why am I not able to have outsized days? Well, guess what? No matter how good you are, if you set the three of us down, and we don't get to pick the tickers, you're losing every day, I'm losing yeah. every day, and Nate's <laughs> losing every day. And that's what people miss. Like, you're only as good as those tickers that you're training. And like, if, if you're, again, if you're not distributing those chips appropriately and putting them all on the most broken game, and if you're putting 90% on, you know, 5149s or the 6040s, you're not gonna go that, that far. But if you simply just play the right game, it's, it's a game changer. Yeah, I, I, we probably all had the experience of having uh you know, just a friend, a neighbor or something, you know, come up to you and, you know, what do you think of this stock? Oh, yeah. Think, <laughs> yeah, and most I'm is not noise. even a trader and that happens to me all the time. <laughs> most, is, most is just randomness and noise. And, and I think we all would agree in almost <coughs> all situations, we don't have edge. It is a very exactly. right. sliver of a subset where all these variables align for us to have any edge whatsoever. But when those do, you can have enormous edge. I agree. Couldn't put it better. Cool. Thanks, guys. Guys, the USS Constitution, seen in the background here, was known as Old Ironsides because the British cannonballs would just bounce off the side in battle. Trading is a tough endeavor. It's a tough career choice. What words of wisdom do you have to maintain some level of grit and perseverance in pursuing a career in trading? I mean, you gotta love what you do. Uh, it's something that you have to be passionate about and uh, it's gonna take a lot of hours. It's gonna take a lot of trial and error. It's gonna take a lot of failure. You gotta go into it knowing you know, that you wanna do it. And, and it's not gonna, you know, if you know it's gonna be hard and you're willing to do it, I, I think it, you know, it's something that can be achieved. And I, th I think too, like, Part of the saying is, if it wasn't hard, everybody would be doing it. And, and one thing I would always try to tell myself is essentially how difficult it is and that feeling of struggle. And when you wanna quit and when you wanna give up, those moments, I, I would turn that into my mental edge. And I would tell myself, Lance, if you're feeling this way, you're 10 times more resilient than everyone else. Everyone else is suffering, everyone else is ready to quit. So Lance, this is where you, surpass everyone, right? This is your specialty. If there's anything you're good at, it's outworking, out competing, and, and not giving up when other people want to. And like, whether it's running a marathon or whether it's anything, like you can apply this to so many skill sets. And like, I reframed the mentality. So I took pride in those hard moments because I knew, look, 
If I'm hurting, everyone else is. And if I want to give up, they're about to tap out. And so I'm just going to keep on going and, and, and not do that. That was my edge. Yeah, I, I think another big thing too about all of that is just being honest with yourself within the moment. Because a lot of people just give it up. They just quit because there's all these different outliers as to the reasons why they fail or aren't, aren't succeeding. Um, and I think that by taking that hard look at yourself and, and in those moments when you're like, I don't know if I should continue to do this, but this is where I'm going to shine. Um, being able to kind of, you know, take a couple steps back and, and see what you could have done better in certain situations and how to rectify that rather than have this out, outward reason as to why you had failed. Yeah, and I, I think edge comes from many places, right? Edge isn't just speed. Edge just isn't your strategy. Edge is also what's in between your ears and like what's in your heart. And being able to say, like, I am going to keep at this. I am going to trust in the process. Um, and and in some ways, just having faith, right? And saying like, I'm going to work as hard as I can, and then just let the chips fall where they may. And if you can really internalize that process, I think it gives you just such an enormous edge over the competition because for every trader, there will be obstacles. But if you can internalize it better than the others, you're gonna have such a higher career and such a longer lasting career. I think having exactly what you said, a process as well is important. I think a lot of people come in here and just have no clue what they're doing and uh, don't really know what going back to basics is or what going back to the process means. And um, I think you need to kind of identify that. And uh, that's what's gonna allow you to propel yourself throughout your career. So I guess not everybody can make it in this business. Like, it's absolutely true. How do you know when you need to tap out? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think that's one of the hardest questions. And I think every trader in, when they were starting probably asked that. And uh, I mean, I think one huge thing that we've all mentioned is uh, when speaking on our own is what are the opportunity costs? Uh, are you seeing progress? Um, and, and ideally setting some type of stop so you know what would failure look like? Um, and when do I need to quit based on my own life situation and everything else? But then also recognizing, uh, you know, having trained so many other people and unfortunately having had to let go of so many people, making sure that it's clear to them or clear to yourself that you're not a failure, right? Like you just didn't succeed at this moment in time with this very niche skill set. That doesn't mean you won't succeed in some other style or some other skill set or anything else. And all the people that ended up moving on from trading, they all found what was right for them. And I think it's one of those things where if you have faith, life takes you where it needs, you know, where you need to get. As far as uh, when to quit, I, I mean, I, I think there are two sides of that coin. I mean, when do you quit because you're not doing well, or when do you quit because you've accomplished what you want to do? Mm. Um, Very true. That's a great question. Yeah, I'd love to hear that answer, even. Um, I, I, I think one of the uh, primary things to think about here would be lifestyle. Something we talked about earlier would be, you know, if you're not living the lifestyle you want and you're because you're working too much you know that's one component which i think we all have to look at because it takes a lot of work to you know be a successful trader and if you don't want to live your whole life you know with that lifestyle and you want to you know do other things in life that's you know you need to build that into your long-term plan as far as um you know what kind of life do you want to live I and mean, that's something you know i'm reflecting on it's like you know i i tend to work way too hard and long when i'm trading and you know, work-life balance is something that has to be uh, put into perspective. Um, you know, as far as um, you know, when to quit if uh, you know if you're not succeeding. I think one important question there would be: um, Are you improving or not? You know, as long as you are still improving. You know, maybe it'll take you 10 or 20 years, but as long as you're improving, you eventually will get it. And enjoying it too, ideally. Enjoying the right. journey. That's a very good point. It seems to be a recurring theme. We've talked about this on several of the podcast episodes, that there seems to be this perception that getting into this business, you know, guys do it because they want financial freedom or independence, but what they don't understand is that like to be a really good trader takes just an enormous amount of work and 
people are being spoon fed this garbage of like guys that are like sitting on the beach in Maui, you know, placing trades for like 30 minutes a day and living this lavish lifestyle. And it's just, it just couldn't be further from the truth. Oh, it's all BS, yeah. And, and all the guys that I know, and you, you three are definitely right in this category, you work harder than anybody I know. And it's just really sad that that perception is warping people's perspective on what it means to enter a career in this industry. So I think it's really important for people to know what they're getting into if they make the conscious decision to try to do this full time and do it for a living. Yeah, and I think many, many people do get lured in by uh, the sex appeal of the job and, and the promises of, of, of easy money, big money, uh, an exciting, fast-paced job, but what, what they don't know is that's, that's just the advertisement. The reality is, the most furthest thing from the truth, right? You know, how many years did I spend alone in an office working till 8 p.m. after everyone else had gone? How many years did I spend the first one in the office working before anybody would get in? How many weekends did I spend uh, studying and reviewing charts when everybody else was out having fun? And this wasn't just for a month, this was for years, you know? And I think it's, it's the reality where, where people want the easy path when, or the easy answer, or what's the trade secret, or what's the formula, or what's the strategy, and people don't want to hear the hard answer, which is there is no easy path, and it's the only path is, 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 is through hard work, dedication, blood, sweat, and tears. And what other job is there zero correlation between like how hard you work and what your guaranteed paycheck is? Like it's, it's one of the few jobs where you can work your ass off and you could still lose money. Yeah. It's, it's like yeah. there's, there's no guarantees and it's, it's definitely not for everybody. And to what Lance was just saying though, um, read the Market Wizards books. All of them, every single chapter, they're all workaholics, you know? I mean, so, so there's you know, every example of the greatest traders in every single one of them, exactly what Lance is describing, you know, just, you know, passionate, hardworking people. There, none of them were trading off the beach, you know? And <laughs> I did not read that in any chapter. <laughs> cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Folks, thank you for tuning in to our special Boston episode of the Traders for a Cause podcast. Thank you to the Breast Cancer Research Foundation for selecting us for the Carolyn Lynch Humanitarian Award. And thank you to my special guests today, Greg, Nate, and Lance. As always, trade, profit, and make a difference. We'll see you next time.